Aloha guys, today I am gonna show you three simple steps. They're gonna make it possible for you to turn anything you can imagine in your brain into a fully functional mid-journey image. Understand, sometimes you just wanna create a cool image and you wanna leave most of the creativity up to mid-journey. Now, if that's how you're using mid-journey, then to be honest, this video isn't gonna be that useful. You're gonna learn a little bit, but this video is really for the situations where you can visualize in your mind exactly what you want, or at least you have a pretty good idea about it, but you can't seem to get mid-journey to spit it out how you're seeing it. And this is exactly what happened for me on one of my thumbnails. I knew what I wanted. I wanted a picture of a skinny, beat-up boxer next to a picture of a massive, successful boxer. And eventually, I created this prompt. 8K photo of a tiny, skinny, scrawny, scraggly boxer standing in the middle of a ring, hunched over, wearing shorts and boxing gloves, beat up and bruised, sweating, dripping, tired, empty stands around with zero fans watching, movie style. And I also created this prompt. 8K photo of a tall, ridiculously oversized, strong buff, seven foot tall, ripped, massive boxer looking into the camera while standing in the middle of a ring, triumphant after a victory, wearing shorts and boxing gloves, hands raised in the air excited, in a huge packed stadium with millions of fans watching movie style. And that's how I made this thumbnail. It worked out perfectly and the video did great. But to make those prompts, I needed a system. Now I spent a ton of time researching how other people build specific prompts. And from it, I've created a system that works for me over and over again. I'm not gonna pretend it's perfect. Sometimes mid-journey just decides to be a pain in the ass. But for most cases, it works really, really well. Now this system is not all original ideas and I have to give a big shout out to Rob Lennon. He shared some great training that helped tremendously with the sequence. If you wanna follow him on Twitter, I'm gonna link him in the description down below. My system follows three basic steps. They are order, marks, and tone. If you follow these steps, you can get Midjourney to spit out the images that are what you imagine. By the way, in case we haven't met yet, I'm David Tatera and I teach businesses how to use AI. If you enjoy this training, I'd greatly appreciate you hitting the like and subscribe buttons. The more subscribers I get, the more views I get, and thus, the more time I get to spend on each video. So your choice to click those buttons fuels a great win-win loop. Okay, let's get started with rule number one. Order. Now, order is about the way that you arrange the five key elements of a prompt, but it's also about the order in which you build the prompt. Often I see people with some or many of these pieces in a prompt, but they're disorganized and they're haphazard and they're all put together in the wrong sequence. The key elements are style, subject, details, background, and modifiers. Now a list of these is gonna be in the description down below, so don't feel like you need to memorize it or go back and watch it again in a hurry. But that's the sequence that you wanna use when you're translating your vision into a prompt. Now the words may not end up completely in that sequence, especially when it comes to modifiers. They kind of fit in everywhere, but that is the order in which we're gonna build it. So I'm gonna walk you through each and every element of this in detail, and I'm gonna show you what it does in mid-journey. I'll show you some complete prompts at the end, so you can also see how this whole thing fits together. Now the style of an image determines the overall feel and the energy of it. Is it a photograph or is it an illustration? Is it colorful or black and white? Style sets the tone and the vibe for the image. So let's take a look at a bunch of different styles of a simple object. A mountain, logo, 8K, RGB, impressionistic, realistic, photorealistic, surrealistic, futuristic, Unreal 5, sticker, coloring book, minimal, phantasmal, 3D, or even something off the wall like Simpsons style. This is also where you want to include things like camera angles, looking up a mountain, a mountain from above, wide angle shot of a mountain, a mountain close up. The style determines if your image will be cartoony or detailed, fantasy or realistic, and the viewpoint of your subject. Now Midjourney tends to put more weight for things that are earlier in the prompt, which is why we wanna set up the style of our image first. Next, we gotta tell Midjourney what to create, which is where we give it the subject of our image. Is it a mountain? a bunny rabbit, Adam Sandler, a car, 
without any style information, Mid Journey tends to try a bunch of different styles. For a bunny rabbit, we got everything from a photograph all the way down to a children's book illustration. We got a few different art styles on our mountain and our car is all over the map. I mean, you got everything from models to artwork to digital creations. So you can see how important setting the style is first. But when it comes to your subject, the key to this is how you phrase it. The specific words that you use to refer to your subject are absolutely crucial. I'm gonna go a lot deeper on this in step number three, tone, but just to give you some ideas, let's look at four different ways to describe a fast car. A hot rod, a rat rod, a street racer, a race car. Now clearly each of these means something very, very different to Mid Journey. The hot rod and rat rod are similar styles of car, but one of them looks ready for a show, while the other one is coming out of a junkyard. Mid Journey thought a street racer referred to a motorcycle, and a race car clearly meant something that you could drive on a professional circuit. Now you could stick a bunch of modifiers in to get the hot rod to be more like the race car, but that's a much, much more clunky and inefficient path than what I'm showing you. Plus it makes things way more complicated down the road. Look, your goal should always be to use fewer more colorful words when you're prompting. Next, we get to the details of our main subject. What is it doing or what's happening to it? A race car zipping around a track, a race car flipping upside down, a race car catching on fire, a race car crossing the finish line, a race car smoking its tires. The goal here is to tell Mid Journey what action the subject should be taking or what action is being done to the subject. This is kind of the verb heavy part of the prompt. Sometimes there won't be much action, like the example of the two boxers I showed at the beginning. The details for this were sweating, tired, hunched over, standing, and so on. Now those details gave the look and the pose of the subject. Then we get to the background. This often alters what images Mid Journey chooses for the subject. For example, if I say race car racing around the Indianapolis Speedway, I get images like this. But if I say race car sliding around a dirt corner, I get completely different backgrounds, but also completely different cars. Mid Journey's been trained on images of race cars skidding in dirt, and it tries to match a car in those pictures. So if you're trying to put something out of its element, you're gonna to need to be much more specific on your subject. I could say Formula One race car sliding around a dirt corner, and that's gonna force the type of car that I want into the background. But even when I try a race car racing around the Indianapolis Speedway, packed full of other cars, racing very closely, I get old fashioned cars for some reason. So I have to add in 2023 so that I get this image, which is what I was looking for. Now, if instead I try for a race car zipping through the streets of New York at night, it's gonna give me a street car style versus a track car style for the race car. So you can see how changing the background alters the subject. And this is why we want to use a build order for your prompt. It's gonna allow you to go back and make the necessary changes at each step so that you keep making progress towards your vision. Now, when I put some full prompts together at the end, you're gonna see how each step works together in this build order to create that ideal image. Okay, last, after we set up our background, we add in the modifiers. Now these are the most colorful and descriptive words in our entire prompt, as well as any commands or any negatives. These explain the feel, the emotions, the energy of that picture, as well as any specific elements that you wanna include. Your modifiers are gonna fit all around at different points throughout the prompt, depending on what piece of the prompt they're modifying. For example, a painting of a hot air balloon, versus a painting of a hot air balloon with energetic brush strokes. Now notice, this is the first time that I have used a comma in any prompt. Commas are way overused and used in the wrong places in most people's prompts. And I'm gonna cover that in just a minute when we talk about marks. But here's a painting of a hot air balloon, dreamy, soft, magical. It's pretty easy to see how the modifiers changed the hot air balloon. Also modifiers include things like your aspect ratio. So if you need to use shorthand like dash dash AR and then whatever ratio you want or negatives like dash dash no clouds. As always, try to use the fewest words that you can to get the job done. My most common negative prompts are dash dash no people and dash dash no text font letters. I really wish there was a shorter way to get the text out of images, but this seems to be the best phrase that I can find that actually does the job. 
Now, I know that may seem a little bit complex, but once you walk through it a few times, this is gonna seem super easy, and it's gonna become second nature as you write your prompts. If you want a written walkthrough of this entire process where you can follow along step by step, you're gonna to wanna to sign up for a free training on my website. I'm teaching a simple class on how I build high quality, well-researched, well-written blog posts in less than seven minutes using GPT-4. And I'm sharing a write-up on this entire training for everyone who takes that class so that they can use it to build their hero images that they use in new blog posts. So just go to 7minuteblog.com and I'm gonna show you all of it. Okay, the next rule we need to cover is marks. Now, my definition of marks includes both punctuation marks and emojis. Both of these are really powerful when they're used correctly. Now, when it comes to breaking apart your prompt, spaces are by far the weakest separator. They practically join the words together. Midjourney is going to see very, very little difference between a firefly and a firefly. Commas begin to break the words apart. Now, commas act like a mild separator between ideas. So Midjourney thinks that what's on one side of the comma and what's on the other side are not completely joined together. However, it's a very subtle distinction. And that's why they get used way, way, way too much. You really need to think about if the words should go together or not before you use a comma. For example, when I wrote the prompt, 8K photo of a ridiculously oversized, strong, buff, seven foot tall, ripped, massive boxer, I intentionally omitted commas. I wanted each word to modify the subject boxer with as little separation as possible. By the way, periods seem to work about the same as commas. Now, semicolons, on the other hand, those are a strong boundary. Using a double colon tells Midjourney to consider each side as completely separate. Let's take a look at a few examples of how these marks actually work. Sunflower, as just one word, gives us that, a sunflower. Sunflower with a space in it gives us a subtle glow from the sun, a little bit of light separation. Adding the comma in there, sun comma flower, makes it two different focal points. You get the sun and the sunflower. Then finally, sun double colon flower gives us a flower with lighting from the sun, but it's not a sunflower. It didn't join the words together at all. Here's another example. A toothbrush gives us some sort of a mutated toothbrush that you couldn't pay me enough money to put in my mouth, while putting a space gets us a more normal looking toothbrush. Then a comma creates a tooth with the toothbrush in its hand. And using a double colon gives us a tooth that's also a brush. Each of these marks has a different effect on the words around it. So you really gotta think about what you're trying to do before just throwing some mark in. In addition to separation, double colons have another power. They can actually override the order of your prompt. Now, as I mentioned, Midjourney looks at the words that are at the beginning of a prompt as being more important than the words that come later, unless you tell it Otherwise, you can actually include both positive and negative values from zero to 10 for any word by adding colon, colon, and then the number. Non-specified words are automatically gonna get a weight of one, and all words together have to add up to a positive value. An example of this would be a bouquet of colorful roses red. This is just gonna give us a bouquet of roses with lots of them being red. Giving the roses a high number and the red and negative number is gonna remove all the red from those rose images. Giving the word colorful and the word roses both negative prompt and red a high number creates a graphic of a bouquet with no roses and no colors, but lots of red. Now you can use these to scale up and scale down different elements of your prompt. Also emojis can be a great way to cut out words by just throwing in a feeling instead. Sometimes if I can't get my words to create the look that I want, then I'll try and play around with some emojis. Now, exactly what each emoji means, that's a bit of a mystery. But here's a few examples just to give you some ideas. This is a man on a motorcycle. Then adding this emoji gives him some shades. Adding this one gives him a skull for a head. Putting in this one colors the whole image with lots of rainbows. Using the tree, gives the whole thing a holiday feel with Christmas lights. Adding the wave emoji makes him riding out of the ocean. And finally, the ice cream emoji seems to confuse Midjourney and they give him a bunch of fruits and vegetables. In any case, 
Emojis are a special type of modifier that I use when I'm struggling to get the right emotion of an image. They are really powerful, and adding just one can have a dramatic change to the image. Now, our final step for mid-journey prompt writing is to make sure we get the right tone. Mid-journey picks up on the tone of a word better than most humans are gonna do. Here's an example. I wanted to create a motorcycle rider image with that 50s sort of greaser style. And I figured out that asking for a bad boy on a motorcycle got it right on the money. Whereas if I asked for a man on a motorcycle, I got kind of an older gentleman. Now requesting a man on a motorcycle in a leather jacket, well, that got me a little bit closer, but still the wrong guy. Now if I added a young, tough guy on a motorcycle in a leather jacket, now I'm getting even closer, but it's still gonna be too preppy of an image for me. Finally, a rough dude riding a motorcycle, wearing a leather jacket, hair flowing in the wind. Now that got me back to that original idea that I had wanted. As you can see, either path is gonna get you there. You can use a hundred words to describe something, and I've seen lots and lots of great long mid-journey prompts. But if you have something specific in mind that you are looking to achieve, saving words gives the ones that you keep in there way more power. After 100 words, each new word you add only gets a tiny piece of the energy, no matter how you order them or how you weigh them. So saying bad boy instead of rough dude wearing a leather jacket, hair flowing in the wind, well, that saves me eight or nine words. And that gives me a lot more control and a lot more power over the rest of my prompt. And those are my three steps to designing any mid-journey prompt. Order, which means your style, subject, details, background, and modifier. Marks, which are basically commas, colons, and emojis. And tone, which boils down to fewer words that are more descriptive. So let's go back and see how I structured those two boxing prompts that I mentioned at the beginning. First comes the style, 8K photo, looking into the camera. This setup that I wanted a realistic image of the subject facing into the camera. Then the subject, boxer. Now Mid Journey seemed to get this right away, so I didn't really need to mess with it anymore. Then the details, standing, wearing shorts and boxing gloves, hands raised in the air. I kept getting boxers in practice gear or wearing a robe and I didn't want that, so I added those details. Then the background, in the middle of a ring, in a huge packed stadium with millions of fans watching. This took him off the streets or out of the gym, into the ring, which is the image that I wanted. Then the modifiers, movie style, a tall, ridiculously oversized, strong, buff, seven foot tall, ripped, massive, Putting all of that in gave him the body and size that I was looking for, as well as the cinematic effects. And yes, I put tall in there twice because it improved the output. I may be giving you a formula, but it's not an exact science. It's a framework that you follow and make changes to along the way. And then the other prompt, again, first comes the style, then the subject, then the details, what I wanted to include in the image. Next, the background to make sure that his scene looks like he just lost. And finally, the modifiers, which gave it the emotions of weakness and frailty. I didn't end up using emojis or negative prompts on either of these, but I did try a few along the way. Sometimes you need them, other times you won't. And I only use a few commas to separate the boxer and the background from the modifiers. All in all, it took me about 15 tries to get the first one right, and about 10 for the second one. But without a framework, it could have easily taken me 100. By following this system, I got the style right. Then I tried out the subject to see what Midjourney gave me. Next, I added in the details that I wanted to include, and then the background location, and finally modifiers to adjust any part of the prompt so that it equaled out to what I imagined. I followed the order and built this prompt step by step. Now, if you're still here, please do me a favor and give me that like and subscribe click. And also, if you're building prompts and images like this, you really need to work in your own private mid-journey room. Trying to iterate in a room with everyone else's images flying at you is just way too chaotic. You need to keep everything organized and stop chasing your prompts up and down, or it's gonna drive you crazy. So if you haven't set up a private room yet, do me a favor and click up here. I'll show you how to do it in less than two minutes.